this is better this time. everybody rock Stalo here drive time shaman morning session <clears throat> how's everybody doing out there I finally got my car back it was getting fixed um, yeah shit's a little hectic right now <laughs> there's some uh, I'm dealing with some very uh, personal issues, some health scares uh, 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 here and there, and uh, I think it's from stress. I think I was letting some stress get to me too much, and uh, I've been feeling a little bit better about things, and and. You know, the stress of just what's happening in the world and everything around us and it's a, it's a heavy burden to bear when you've seen some horrific things like I've seen and, and the possibilities of where the world could go. I was talking about it last night. I was a guest on uh, Fringe FM out of Arkansas and Lighting the Void is the name of the show. And I was discussing it on the show last night. Now, when you witness something horrific, whether it's a, a vision or a traumatic experience, and you can see the possibility of how evil the world can be, it should change you. It should change way you feel about the world and the way you, you live your life. But I got my car back. I just gonna the last thing I gotta do is get an oil change. That's where I'm going right now. But I got it fixed. I literally had to like max out my credit just to get this car fixed. But everything's gonna work out. I have faith because uh, I think it's gonna be a whole new change for a lot of people this next year. And it could be the beginning of governments collapsing and, and a whole new way of living comes in. I just hope we don't go the route of China. Israel and, and places like like this where our artificial intelligence is directing the the life of, of everyone. They're aware of how you're thinking, what you're doing, uh, what you're thinking about. All of this thing is uh, is the, the the first step in us losing who we are. So I've been... Let me see who's in the chat room. Good, good afternoon. It's good morning here. Yeah, it's good morning. It's, it's not early, early, but it's 9.45 in the morning here. And, uh... Oh man, did I get off the wrong? Yeah, I got off the wrong exit. What am I doing? Give me a second. I gotta turn around. Yeah, so, uh, I made a wrong turn. I gotta turn around for a second. But, 
Good morning, everybody. What I wanted to talk about, too, is, is I'm writing a book about obelisks. Uh, I just found out, too, um, I don't know the guy, but I have friends that are friends of him. And uh, I don't necessarily uh, agree with all of his theories and his research, but I definitely respect all the time and energy he's put in to all this. Um, and that's David Hatcher Childress. I just found out he also did... Uh, a book about obelisks. Uh, I've been writing my book for like a couple years now, so um, I wasn't even aware that he did a book about it until like two weeks ago, a week ago. And uh, I wonder, I wonder what he's got in there. I know, I think he talks about the the obelisks on the moon, and I know there's even one supposedly on one of the moons of Mars. Actually, there's way more than that. They're all over. Um, there's a, they're used as a network of energy in, in the whole galaxy. And I, 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 uh, I've done viewings that have shown me obelisks all places. Um, and the amount of information and a, like a remembrance of the past that gets awakened in me when I research about these topics is truly amazing and I really feel like that there's certain researchers that once lived that I'm continuing even their work and they're they're just like almost like a, a fractal or, or a little fragment of a spark of who they all who they were is sort of entwined in my research and and who I am as well. And they help guide us in a way, I think. And I feel it. And I, I felt it with uh, not all people, not all researchers that I've I've, I've looked into their work, but a, a, a rare few while looking into their work and researching, just uh, floods of memories would come back to me. And uh, I, I was, Getting information that's not in the book as well uh, about certain locations and for certain objects. So how's everybody doing this morning? Well, the obelisks, uh, hey Lori. This is a very interesting, amazing rabbit hole to go down. Uh, of course, I think some cultures might not know the full reason why they even worship it at certain periods of time in, in history. But at certain periods of time in history, on the other hand, they were used as high tech. And I feel that the obelisks and the pyramids, they go hand in hand. They're put on strategic spots. And the pyramids are accumulating some of the energy that's being beamed into the obelisk. And the obelisk is, is connected to celestial bodies. It can even cause a plasmic burst out of the sun. And, and it could cause uh, our earth to get scorched. So it can be weaponized. And it can be used for a harmony or for chaos. And uh, I've been doing intense research on them. I've been going over the inscriptions on all the obelisks that are in history that we can find and talk about. Mainly, I've been focusing on the obelisks that were taken from ancient Egypt and used within Italy and put on strategic spots of ley lines and certain energy vortexes on sacred spots in, in Italy. And this is what I've been focusing on and why my book is, is titled uh, Obelix of the Apocalypse. And uh, there's some groundbreaking information I have in there. Especially I have some of my theories about red granite and some of my visions on how I believe red granite was actually made. And, and different, different types of granite. There's also a... a a thicker type of granite substance. It's a granite-like material that's found in the Aswan Quarry uh, as big, big balls 
uh, of uh, of a harder like granite substance that some people theorize that they were used for rock cutting. Um, I, I do believe they were rolled like Play-Doh, like, uh, like clay. Uh, of course, there's, uh, there's an old book that I have talking about the unfinished obelisk of the Aswan Quarry. And, uh, I do feel that they had some sort of cutting blade that came down and, or they had like a mold of metal to make a certain obelisk and they just put it down and pushed it down into it when it was still soft. The granite was soft like flesh at one time and they were able just to, to build a trench around it sort of like with a, with a, either a metal box or a metal, a metal cutting shaped it as the size that they want to, to make the obelisk, the, the, the mold of it. But uh, the unfinished obelisk is one of the biggest obelisks in the world. I mean, it's, I think it's damn near a thousand tons. And it's, uh, it's, it's sitting there in the Aswan Quarry laying laying down in the ground, you know, they, they, they sort of like, uh, dug out the, dug it out a few years back, I'm not sure if it was in the 1800s they dug it out, or, or something like that, but, that is an amazing obelisk, you'll see in the, the thumbnail that I have in the picture here, is a very interesting uh, scarabus. It's a scarabus stone. It's the, the replica and drawing of the scarabus stone that has a very interesting scene of the obelisk. Um, this will be featured in my book as well because I'm doing a whole chapter on the scarabus technology. It's not just about obelisks. I'm doing stuff on, on spiritual technology as well. And spiritual grid of ancient Egypt and the different uh, capabilities and, and, and qualities of each town of Egypt is a different spiritual coordinate and had different jobs within the cycle of, of death and rebirth and, and resurrection and all of this. Yeah, so it's uh, it's really exciting because I mean, if you look into it, most likely you're. Let me see. I'm trying to see in the, in the chat room. Yeah, I'm not sure of that guy, Hans. Whatever. I can't really read because I'm driving. But uh, the next month or two is going to be pretty busy on my show. Uh, I know November's completely booked. I got Jorge Martin coming on, back on. I got a guy named Jason Quit coming on. Uh, I got Solaris Blue Raven coming on again, Gary Wayne. So, uh, it's funny how on, um, on Joe Rogan podcast, I heard now even on his podcast, he had somebody from the Navy that was on it that talked about having some sort of uh, UFO encounter or some sort of craft off the coast of Puerto Rico. And, and how they're showing it in the mainstream now, like all of a sudden Joe Rogan's on some big discovery. I've been talking about this for the last five years with Jorge Martin on my radio shows. He's been reporting on, on the activity in and around Puerto Rico since the 70s. So, uh, people, this ain't nothing new. We've been, we've been trying to show you, you all for, for years. But uh, I guess until it's on Joe Rogan that it's not, it's not out and believes. It's kind of weird. But the Navy has been, been involved with 
the, the dimensional gateways that are in and around the El Yunque rainforest and the Caribbean area. And the Navy has secret bases over there, possibly even underneath the water there as well. So, don't be fooled by all that. There is some sort of time gate that's been, I don't know if it's been ripped open or it moves from one place to the next that's in and around Puerto Rico and especially within the El Yunque rainforest. And I've been reporting on it with Jorge Martin for many, many years. And Jorge, he was, he's known in Puerto Rico for reporting on, he's an amazing artist as well. Um, he was even featured on Unsolved Mysteries back in the 80s about the Chupacabra. And he was one of the first pe person to do an artistic rendition of some of the people's encounters that they were describing to him. And his son, he reported on my show about his son. His son was a off, uh, police officer in Puerto Rico. And they literally had something land on top of the police station while they were in there. And they ran up to the top of the police station. And they got frozen in, in just time when they saw what was up there. It was a literal uh, eight to nine foot saurian type gargoyle it was a, a a walking humanoid gargoyle type being huge bat wings and it was eight to nine foot tall some sort of alien type saurian uh being and it had there was uh, a cat like roadkill laying on the floor in front of it like it had dropped it the people came up there and they had flashlights on it and and everything and uh, they were they were like frozen in time looking at its weird eyes. They said it's red glowing eyes. And it then flew off. And I mean, he's after, you know, he retired from being a police officer after that. And, uh, you know, he told, of course, his father, who was a, a reporter in Puerto Rico, Jorge Martin. And, uh, you know, I don't think a porter, uh, a police officer risk his reputation and, and and ridicule and it's a highly credible story and there's all ports uh, reports of Puerto Rico uh, like portals type things opening up and even flying pterodactyl type creatures coming out big type reptile creatures now in the past these flying reptile type creatures are known to come from other dimensions and cause plagues I reported it the other day how supposedly the race of the Nurians, the Nuroi, the Nuri, who was a shamanistic culture, supposedly they were chased, and even the Sinocephaly were chased off of our realm by flying plagues of reptiles, like flying locusts. Yeah, I've seen some of uh, Roger from Mud Fossil stuff. I, I, I'm highly intrigued by it because uh, when I watched some of the stuff that he talked about with Red Granite after somebody pointed me over there because they were like, oh, a lot of the, what you're saying uh, is would, uh, would line up to what Roger from Mud Fossil. So I checked him out. And while he was talking about certain things, I was getting flashes of um, more things that I saw that I, that I, I believe was how the granite was made. I even saw these drums that almost are like needles. Not, they were more like a, uh, in almost like a, um, round on the top and then like a, like this, almost like a, an upside down cone sort of and in the middle it's gyrating and moving around and they had a, a long stem coming out of it. And I, I do think they were mixing bodies like this, and then pre then it was squeezed out like Play-Doh and pressed. Uh, I was seeing it being pressed even. So, uh, 
very interesting and I do think uh, what I saw these were what, what the ancients called the cynocephaly these these dog-like beings that were helping make the granite and were commissioned to make it and they're, they're com they were commissioned for war for certain places they're also commissioned to be master builders they have a spiritual energy about them as well that I sense that's that's really intense um, so guys we're gonna pick it up in a little while I'm about to take care of something right now so thank you and spiral out